We are at an exquisitely painful moment in the history of our nation and the world. In many places, the pandemic continues to kill thousands of people a day, disrupts many activities that bring meaning to our lives, threatens economies, and continues to place enormous burdens on healthcare systems and the professionals who work there. Disproportionate deaths and hospitalizations have laid bare egregious income gaps, widespread poverty, poor rural healthcare access, and systemic racism. And the virus continues mutating in troubling ways that may undo the incredible scientific progress that we've had so far. So why, nearly two years in, are we still facing huge challenges? After all, a lot's gone right. Science has come through in a nearly miraculous way, bringing effective vaccines and promising therapeutics, at least to those of us in the wealthy nations. Bioethics has come through. It's offered guidance for the many ethical questions that pandemics always raise. Bioethics has been particularly helpful in guiding COVID research oversight, questions about trial design, for example, and in guiding clinical decision-making, for example, triage protocols for crisis standards of care. But neither science nor bioethics has been effective on many larger policy questions, big questions that bear on how should we live together? How should we live together in managing this pandemic and the pandemics that are undoubtedly going to follow? For example, should we be providing more vaccines to other countries or completing boosters here on, in our own? What's the best way to navigate the tension between national sovereignty on the one hand and international obligations on the other? Closer to home, what are the best ways to ensure adequate uptake of the vaccines? Are mandates a sound policy? These are big societal questions, what I'm calling the how should we live together questions. And they're hard, precisely because they require collective decision-making. They require good governance and public investment. And that requires a sense of common purpose, a willingness to work together on behalf of the common good, some level of compromise and even personal sacrifice. And at the very moment when we need high levels of social cohesion and care for one another the most, we are facing a profound erosion of trust. Trust in one another and trust in science. This lack of trust undermines our sense of common purpose and makes it extremely difficult to solve collective problems, whether those problems are pandemics or poverty or AI driven surveillance or climate change. There needs to be sufficient trust in a society to have effective governance and health policy that ends up being acceptable to the public. So the main lesson in my view from these past 20 months is the urgent need to build trust and a sense of common purpose. And I've tried to visualize that in this diagram. I'm going to talk about the centrality of trust and in three distinct but overlapping domains. First, with regard to public health infrastructure, second in regard to health equity, and third in regard to what I'm gonna call civic learning, and I'll define that later in the talk. So let's begin with the first, with public health infrastructure. Our society invests vastly more in cures and rescue medicine than it does in prevention and public health. One estimate is that we spend about 3.6 trillion, that's with a T, dollars on health annually, but only 3% of that is spent on public health and prevention. For years, we've allowed our public health infrastructure to, la to language, languish, and I don't need to recount all the ways in which we were unprepared when COVID hit. But all of that was avoidable. We've known for years that pandemics were coming and careful guidance was already out there in the form of major reports by the National Academy of Medicine and key state bodies like the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law. Uh, um, they, for example, did guidelines on how to prepare for avian flu. Now the diseases were different, 
but most of this advice was similar and it converged on the ethical requirement to prepare, to prepare in all kinds of ways from storing, you know, stockpiling equipment to um, building and sustaining contact, the ability to do contact tracing and widespread testing. We, we knew what to do. We had written and published what to do, but still we didn't do it. And I think it's worth pausing over why. You know, first of all, the obvious is that there are economic drivers behind rescue that are not that don't, don't exist for public health readiness. That's because cures capable of rescuing us from disease usually come in the form of medicines and devices that can be commercialized. There's no com similar commercial incentive for public health readiness. Second, there's a time scale problem. To be effective, we must spend money now and keep spending it to sustain readiness for an uncertain benefit sometime in the future. And it takes extraordinary political leadership with integrity to ask the current electorate to sacrifice for uncertain benefits and unknown beneficiaries down the road. Very often when we're faced with these kind of time scale problems, we humans do what we do, which is to procrastinate. But despite these constraints, I think there are things we can do. And I'm gonna propose four things under this topic of public health infrastructure. First, I think we can build a cultural narrative that values prevention as much as rescue, or at least a lot more than we currently value it. As a young social scientist early in my career, the Boston newspapers and TV airwaves were covering the story of a toddler in urgent need of a kidney. The media story was everywhere, and it seemed like the whole city was holding its breath until a kidney could be found for this little girl. Let, let's call her Amanda. Then suddenly a kidney was available. And again, the airwaves were alive with excitement with many commentators beaming at this happy ending. And I was glad for Amanda, but I also couldn't help think about who was it a happy ending for? Certainly for Amanda, but it turns out that Amanda's new kidney came from another toddler, let's call Elizabeth, whose parents had not secured her into a car seat. This was a time before public health had mounted its successful car seat laws. Amidst the celebrations for Amanda, no one mentioned that Elizabeth's death was most likely preventable if we had had such public health legislation in place. But messages of prevention like that just don't have the same appeal. They don't engender the same compassion as narrative focused on rescue. The need to use car seats is not as exciting or exhilarating as the awesome story of what biomedical technologies like organ transplantation can do. I was so concerned by the uneven levels of compassion toward these two toddlers that I wrote an op-ed which appeared in the Boston Globe. I think all of us can be alert to the opportunities to contribute to narratives that help the public understand prevention and public health and how public health tools differ from health and healthcare, but crucially imp impact healthcare, as we've seen dramatically illustrated throughout this pandemic. So that's the first thing. And th then in addition to you know, promoting the public health in general, I think we also need to get smarter about the concerns and questions that different communities and different demographic groups have and use science and what we know from social science and from cognitive science to design specific messages for each group delivered by messengers they can identify and trust. So that's point two. Most communities respond best when public health messages are delivered by people like themselves. In fact, cognitive science has made it clear that the messenger is actually more important than the message. And we can see some very successful examples of this. There were um, excellent campaigns developed and delivered by black celebrities and other African-American leaders for the black community. And these campaigns have made important strides in increasing vaccination rates there. They're not perfect yet. There's still many areas where there's a lack of access as well as vaccine hesitant ad attitudes, but those programs have made um, an important contribution. We've also seen um, customized programs that have been delivered, developed and delivered by evangelicals for evangelicals 
who as a group have been split about 50-50 in their views on vaccination. So having specialized programs for that community has been important. Third, I'm envisioning that we build a community health worker corps. Members of the corps could serve as the messengers that I've just described. Um, they could be drawn from many different diverse communities and trained to both do general public health explanations, but also specific campaigns as a particular public health threat emerges. During the pandemic, Massachusetts developed an innovative way to attract a number of people to serve as contact tracers and train them very quickly. Why not designate hairdressers, barbers, pharmacists, and other community members in advance so that they are trained and standing ready to be tapped for the next public health crisis? And finally, in my dream list, I imagine the federal government could invest and should, I think, in research on effective health and science communications. This could be a government agency, but better still, an independent non-governmental organization that's supported with government funds. Its remit would be to anticipate how best to communicate about emerging issues in science and public health with various public audiences. It could study the effectiveness of that community health worker corps I just described. Uh, it could um, be mounted for specific public health crises, not just the need to vaccinate in a pandemic, but other topics, the overuse of antibiotics or whatever the next big issue is that's coming down the pike. I think, you know, certainly parts of CDC already do this, and I may have read that this is being considered in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, but um, I think we need to do it and do it on a big scale with generous funding. So those are my suggestions for the first priority, priority area of building public health infrastructure. And now I'd like to turn to the next area, advancing health equity. COVID-19's terribly unequal toll on African Americans, Native Americans, and the Latinx community has dramatically illuminated what we've known for decades. People of color in the United States live dramatically shorter and harder lives. The average life expectancy for an African American man right now is 68. For a white man, it's 76, an eight-year differential. For black women, there's a six year differential, 75, almost 76, 75.8. And for white women, 81. We've known for a very long time that black Americans face the burdens of chronic illness much earlier than whites and have significantly poorer health outcomes on a number of dimensions. But throughout the 20th century, we didn't fully understand why. There were many hypotheses. As important as poverty is, as a determinant of health, and it is very important. Some thought that poverty alone accounted for the differences. People also had other hypotheses. They thought it was because African-Americans distrusted the healthcare system and came in later for care when disease was more advanced. And there's some truth to that because they lacked insurance, some truth to that, or um, didn't have transportation. All of these things were hypotheses. And it's noteworthy that these hypotheses had, had to do with healthcare professionals' perceptions of patients of color and their life circumstances, but nothing to do with the behavior of the healthcare professionals themselves. And then came a landmark report in 2002 by the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, unequal treatment. And many of you will remember this report. It was a blockbuster. It synthesized a whole new generation of research. This new body of research showed an important causal factor that few people would have expected or accepted without the sophisticated studies to back it up. And that causal factor, implicit physician bias, which was shown to result in significant under referral to specialist care, unconscious physician bias. Now, unequal treatment documented hundreds of studies that controlled for all the other things people had been thinking about for years. They controlled for lack of insurance, they controlled for differences in patient preferences, and for many other factors thought to cause unequal outcomes. And of course, some of these factors do play a role, but when you control for them, 
There's no escaping that a significant additional factor was that physicians were refer referring fewer African-Americans for specialist care than white patients. And therefore, black patients had less and later utilization of color of care. Now, unequal treatment has a hundred page appendix, which lists hundreds of such studies. And I'm going to show you just one to give you a flavor of the implicit bias these studies documented. And I've just chosen this one to be very, I mean, really it's just symbolic or emblematic of the point I'm trying to make. It's a study by Kevin Schulman, John Eisenberg and their colleagues from several academic medical centers and from the Rand Institute. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, <clears throat> I think 1997. And so it was drawn upon in the 2002 report. Um, epidemiological studies had reported differences in the use of cardiovascular procedures like cardiac catheterization and uh, by, by race and by sex. The, these differences by race and by sex were known. But as I mentioned, the reasons were unclear. And Schulman and his colleagues hypothesized that it might have to do with physician recommendations and specifically whether physicians referred all their patients at the same rate for, for cardiac catheterization. So the research team constructed an online survey with standardized patients who in video segments described their symptoms. The physicians were given, the, the physicians who were in the study, who were being studied, were given consistent information about these patients' symptoms, their background health, their type and severity of comorbidities. And all the patients were described as having insurance and as having a family history of myocardial infarction. They made sure to dress the white and black patients in equivalent ways. I'm gonna show you here an example of what the black patients looked like. Um, on this next slide, um, the top row were designed to, look, the actors were dressed and designed to look like they were roughly in, in their mid fifties. Um, the patients in the bottom row in their mid seventies. And then here's how the white patients looked on the next slide. Um, I think you'll agree they did a good job of creating equivalence in age and in socioeconomic characteristics. Now the results of their study, and so the doctors in the survey were asked to say what, you know, how they would handle these symptoms. Would they, rec what would they recommend for somebody for catheterization or how, et cetera. And the results were really striking. Both race and sex were highly significant predictors for rates of referral for catheterization. This was after controlling for all the other potential predictors. They even controlled for physicians' own assessment of the risk that they thought each patient presented. They also found a very important interaction between race and sex with black women being referred much less than any other group. With the sophisticated ways in which they had controlled for other predictors, it was hard to say that anything other than physicians' lack of referral could account for these differences. So that was a big, it was studies like that that, that was, were the impetus for unequal treatment. Now, it was limited, in a, as breathtaking as, as those findings are, it was limited in some ways too, because it only focused on unequal access to care and unequal medical treatment. In other words, it uncovered individual unconscious bias that resulted in less access to care. But these two early, these early 20th century studies that it was based on could not say much of anything about the social determinants of health, the structural injustices that disadvantage communities of color. Thanks to sociologists like Nancy Krieger and Oh, I should say social epidemiologists, yeah, like Nancy Krieger, and sociologists like David Williams, also the legal historian Richard Rothstein and philosopher Elizabeth Anderson. We can now trace the connection between historical and political injustices that in turn created unequal social determinants of health and ultimately inequitable health outcomes for communities of color. So, let me start with a personal example to explain what I mean by a structural inequity and a historical inequity. After World War II, my dad went to college and later to professional school on the GI Bill. That education 
was paid for by a grateful country for his service. And it was critical. It lifted my family into the middle class. If he hadn't had that education, we would not have been a middle class family. And so it was responsible for a lot of the opportunities I've had in my life and a generation, a whole generation later, and even another generation beyond in the lives of my kids. But historical research shows that most African-American soldiers returning from World War II were blocked from access to the GI Bill and therefore denied the same opportunities for education that my family had. The practice of 20th century redlining also denied black Americans access to mortgages. And that too has had a tremendous ripple effect across generations. It locked African-Americans into residentially segregated neighborhoods with worse schools, which then links to poorer prospects for higher education and well-paying jobs. Um, not to mention the toll that is taken by poor housing stock, lead contamination, food deserts, and a lack of safe green recreational spaces. We also learned that the daily experience of discrimination that Black Americans face leads to chronic inflammation, which in turn leads to the onset of, the, of chronic illness, roughly, as I mentioned before, about 10 years ahead of white Americans. So we've learned through these studies that there are multiple interlocking causal explanations, including social, economic, and environmental ones that account for health inequities. My colleague, Tia Powell, who heads the Bioethics Center at Montefiore in New York, shared an example with me that makes this point. Montefiore is located in the Bronx, the poorest, most disadvantaged borough in New York City. A Montefiore pediatric surgeon noticed that her practice was getting far more children with broken bones, particularly among black boys, than one would expect. And she realized that there could be many reasons, nutrition, genetics, even neglect, but it was determined as she paid attention that the main reason was lack of parks and spaces to play. These kids were playing on the streets and running into traffic after errant balls. As the story goes, the pediatric surgeon noticed this and then she did something more than surgery to address it. She worked with the community to create green recreational space. There are similar efforts unfolding today in Denver where the community is planning on planting hundreds of trees in its most disadvantaged neighborhood. They're doing this as an environmental adaptation to global warming because it's been recognized that these segregated areas uh, where there's historically been little investment in public parks or trees, these areas are the ones that are experiencing um, very harmful health effects as the temperatures rise. So the question I'd like to pose to all of us and which we can discuss at the end is how far do healthcare providers' responsibilities go? My answer is that at a minimum, healthcare professionals should study disparities in their own patient populations and then design interventions specifically targeted to redressing them, to redressing problems like under referrals to specialist care, any kind of care delivery problem and follow-up services that are re directly related to care. That's a bare minimum. But one could also go beyond care delivery into community interventions like the Montefiore surgeon. Um, and that is not the only example. Um, some health systems are teaming up with lawyers and tenant rights organizations to make sure landlords respond to environmental threats that are undermining children's health. Some organizations frustrated by repeat bouts of life-threatening asthma are providing air conditioners for the homes of their pediatric patients. So how far do you think healthcare professionals responsibilities should go? And what's reasonable to expect of healthcare organizations? What should become a core responsibility, a professional responsibility? And what should be supererogatory beyond what is ob obligatory? Something praiseworthy, but not essentially to be required. Um, I can't begin to recount the many options available to earnest health systems that are committing themselves to advancing health equity, but. I know that Mayo is doing some things. Today it was announced that Mayo is um, developing some affordable housing in your community, which I thought was a terrific example of doing something um, 
that goes above and beyond the definition of healthcare delivery, but speaks directly to health inequities. Um, I think an important place to begin for those of us who are earnestly trying to figure out what we can do is a, the basic beginning spot is a real desire to learn. Um, at the Hastings Center, we began by kind of self-study, reading as many books as we could at the beginning to think about what how to approach this. We also made a commitment to building a pipeline of young people um, whom we hope will take an interest in bioethics from much more diverse backgrounds so that the field can be better diversified. For example, we have a new program called the Sadler Scholars, which brings PhD students of color together to, dis to discuss their dissertations and they receive mentoring from our scholars on staff. This summer, we're going to launch a summer program for college undergraduates to expose them to bioethics, and we will heavily recruit participants from historically Black universities and colleges. And maybe the thing we're doing that is of most interest to you, you is that we are co-sponsoring a two-day health equity summit with the uh, Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC, the American Medical Association, and the American Nurses Association on January 19th and 20th called Tackling Health Inequities, Righting the Wrongs. We also will be having the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation and the American Hospital Association are gonna be joining us as well. And it's a two-day conference and here's how it's organized. Um, Isabel Wilkerson, the author of CAST and of, of another wonderful book uh, called The Warmth of Other Suns, um, she will be the, keynote speaker to launch the two days. The first day is going to focus on the history of Jim Crow, explaining the historical antecedents of residential segregation. The second day of the conference though is gonna be on health and healthcare solutions. It will include four panels on anti-racist strategies for clinical care, health policy, research, and medical and nursing education. And so this is an uh, unalloyed uh, advertisement. You can register here at this um, URL, um, and I hope I hope you will join us. Okay, so that brings me to the third component of that circle I showed at the very beginning. We've talked about public health infrastructure. We've talked about health equity. Now I want to talk finally about civic learning. I began this talk by focusing on the lack of social cohesion and trust that's now growing in many countries around the world and certainly here. And I asserted that a sense of common purpose and trust are essential if we are going to manage pandemics and a wide array of other collective action problems like climate change. One of the fault lines exacerbating distrust and making it very hard to figure out how to live together has been the challenge of navigating an age old ethical tension that's always seen in pandemics, the tension between individual liberty and the common good. There's a long tradition of laws, practices and norms that have recognized that during times of existential threat like pandemics, the state needs and must have authority to restrict some liberties demanding, for example, quarantine or isolation or cordoning off a region by restricting travel. I was in Dubrovnik, Croatia several summers ago and my host pointed with pride to this building. We were in the old city and we were looking across and, we saw, and he, he wanted me to see this building, these ancient walls. He told me that it was the first facility used in Europe to quarantine international travelers to Dubrovnik, which was the New York City or the Hong Kong of its time. It was a major hub of international trade and travel. That was in 1377, more than 600 years ago. They were quarantining in Dubrovnik when they had a threat to the common good. And my host, my friend and colleague was proud of this because it demonstrated his nation's very early understanding of science, admittedly a rudimentary understanding of how infectious diseases transmitted, but they got the basics. He was proud of that. And he was proud because it showed a state governing well. 
by acting to protect its population, by acting for the common good. Today, there is a dangerous misunderstanding of liberty. People are waving don't tread on me flags, both literally and figuratively, asserting that state requirements to wear a mask or to get vaccinated are serious restrictions on their liberty. States are passing legislation or their governors are drawing up executive orders to make it illegal for school districts or county governments to require basic protections like masks. And some states are attempting to stop employers from requiring vaccinations as a condition of work. These actions are being justified on the basis of liberty claims. In my view, these are false claims, ones that are based on a misunderstanding of liberty. For hundreds of years, political philosophies of all stripes have recognized that one's rights end where one's actions harm others. John Locke, whose 17th century writings on liberty greatly influenced our nation's founders and our own constitution, emphasized that liberty is not synonymous with permission to harm others. And on the next slide is a fantastic quote that we should all keep close to us. Reason, he said, teaches all mankind who will but consult it, being all e that, that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Again, that's, that one is about almost 400 years old, 350 or so. The lives of the immunocompromised for whom the vaccines may be less protective, as well as the health of children too young to vaccinate are on the line. Also, we need to ask what is liberty for, if not to create the conditions in which people can flourish and as new variants like Omicron emerge, there's growing likelihood of restrictions on social interaction, travel, recreation, and education. Far from supporting liberty, vaccine refusal is undermining. It's undermining the opportunities to flourish for all of us, as well as the rights of the vaccinated. Now, I don't mean to imply that public plot policy here is cut and dry or black and white. Not all state public health measures should be defended. They're, not all public health measures are always reasonable nor self-evidently right. For us to support limitations on our, on our movement and on our behavior, those limitations should be reasonable and proportionate and not unduly restrict, not unduly restrict individual rights. But the key words here are the qualifiers, unduly reasonable and proportionate. Like many criteria in ethics, they require careful consideration. They're not self-evident. People see when a law or policy goes over the line to become unduly restrictive or unreasonable or disproportionate. But to draw those lines, to draw any lines anywhere, is to make well-considered judgments. And we need enough trust in one another to have a meaningful conversation to make those judgments. In the end, state policies may not be acceptable to all of us, they rarely are, but they should at least have been informed by science, discussed in trustworthy venues, and include explanations or justifications that are transparent and well-explained. And of course, we should not just do everything scientists tell us. Ultimately, questions like whether to lock down or not or to mandate vaccines are political questions, ones that need to be informed by science, but decided through civic participation and good governance. And unfortunately, it's civic partic participation and good governance that is now threatened by forces that have undermined trust and made all of us vulnerable to conspiracy theories and demagoguery and greatly impeded our ability to manage this pandemic. Earlier this year, the Hastings Center examined the erosion of democracy in the United States and offered recommendations for building more robust, respectful, and inclusive citizen participation. The next slide shows the cover of the report we produced. We called it Democracy in Crisis. And I hope you can see the subtitle. <clears throat> it's Civic Learning and the Reconstruction of Common Purpose. Now by civic learning, we meant 
all the activities by which citizens learn about, talk about, and make collective decisions about civic issues. This happens at many levels of society and takes many forms. It could be classroom debates, community town halls, um, special structured deliberations. When civic learning is encouraged and practiced, people develop habits of the heart and habits of mind that build trust and a sense of common purpose. But citizen participation has been in decline for decades. So our report describes a path forward for strengthening civic learning. <clears throat> and I'm not gonna say too much about it because I want us to, to leave some time for talking, but let me just give you a high, high look at some of the topics. I think first and foremost, we take justice to be a basis for civic participation. So the health equity part of this talk is really central. It means that we need to redress systemic racism as well as the vast material inequalities in American society, the big wealth gap. Democracies don't do well when there's extreme, when there's no middle and lots of extreme wealth or poverty. Civic learning requires a sense of common purpose and without justice, citizens don't, can't develop um, a sense of common purpose because they won't recognize uh, when, they're, when, they're, when they realize that their interests are being ignored and they and the communities they live in are struggling to survive. Therefore, the report calls on the provision of basic public goods like health care, equality education, food security, and housing as essential to building the conditions for democracy. The report also acknowledges that the business models of broadcast media, the internet, and social media monetize public attention and therefore create strong incentives to share outrageous, bizarre, and conflict-provoking information. This problem with social media has to be fixed either through regulation or perhaps by replacing it with business models that create incentives that surface much more trustworthy information. Either way, I don't know what the root is, but it can't go on like this. There are many other recommendations in the report, including reforms to science education, how we teach science, and to the restoration of civics as an important area of skills and knowledge in the school regular school curricula. So I'm not gonna try to say any more. You can actually receive a summary of the findings and you can also get, have a, actually get the report itself. I've put my um, colleagues email address, Shifra Vizzi is vizzys at thehastingcenter.org. She will be happy to send you the report. And also, I believe that um, if you visit my Twitter, uh, Mildred Z. Solomon, uh, I've also made the report um, available there. And when you are contacting Shifra, she can also send you a link for the January Health Equity Summit with Isabel Wilkerson. Um, okay, we can stop sharing the screen. I, I want to close with an optimistic message. I've named a number of threats to public health and democratic participation, but there are also important cultural shifts toward a more compassionate and inclusive future. Sorry about that. Despite the alarming growth in white supremacist groups, Despite the alarming growth in white supremacist groups, recent polls show that a much larger percentage of us than ever before in American history believe that racism is a big problem. There is also growing recognition that hourly wages must rise and even support in some quarters across the polit political spectrum, including liberals and, and conservatives for a universal basic income because people are realizing that artificial intelligence is likely to displace millions of workers. And other wonderful things, scientists have shared their findings with unmatched speed and collaboration. And healthcare professionals have demonstrated enormous fortitude far beyond what should be expected of you, demonstrating that there is ample goodness, compassion, and courage among Americans. If we grasp these glimmers of hope and amplify them, we can choose the moral path. We can build a stronger, more sustainable, more trustworthy society. So let's do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Solomon, for a wonderfully inspiring talk. We have one question already from Dr. Mahar. Um, 
she says, news is breaking today that a patient in Minnesota has been diagnosed as having the Omicron variant. In the state, we're already experiencing a Delta wave and clinical backlog that is stretching health infrastructure to the limit. What ethical advice do you have for Mayo Clinic employees, clinicians, researchers, and learners facing this new uncertainty at a time of historically low morale in the health professions? Well, I think you could tell from my remarks, although I, st I stopped short of of advocating mandates, I am an advocate of mandates. I, I think it's inexcusable that, uh, especially in healthcare, because of the oath that healthcare professionals take to protect others and because of the critical role they play. So I do believe that we should be embracing mandates. And um, I think there's a social role for healthcare organizations to do everything they can to demonstrate how the community ha now has to support them. They've been supporting communities. Now the community has to support them. So we need a real public campaign to, to let people understand what you guys are going through and dramatically let them know. I mean, it needs a, it needs a marketing campaign almost, um, as well as more grassroots interpersonal um, dialogue between neighbors and doctors and their patients. So I think it's, it's on all those fronts. It's, very distressing. And it's very frustrating because the science is amazing that we that we actually have effective vaccines is quite in such short order is something that is just incredible. And now it's the social science that's stopping us from having the benefits of the science. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Oh dear. Yes, I was expecting a lot more here. But... Uh, so I, I, um, I, uh, I have a question for the group, which is how far do you, I asked that question in, in the midst of my formal remarks. How far does healthcare providers obligate, do, uh, do uh, healthcare providers obligations? I mean, it's a genuine question. Uh, my fellows ask that all the time. <laughs> and I think it's a really important question. Do you mean in, in, uh, in general, like you had suggested uh, in the example you took where the pediatric um, orthopedic surgeon went yeah. above and beyond, or do you mean specifically? Yeah, yeah I mean, as bioethicists in the healthcare system, should we be encouraging what, what Mayo just announced today that it's developing more, uh, you know, more affordable housing. This seems so praiseworthy. I don't know that one could call it an obligation. It seems supererogatory, but it's certainly praiseworthy. And so, you know, for uh, here's another example. There's been an effort, and it's an ongoing effort at the National Academy of Medicine to have healthcare take a careful look at what it's doing to contribute to climate change. And I think for sure, it seems almost like obligatory to look at how one might be adding to the carbon footprint in healthcare practices. That seems almost clear to me. It's an easy yes, it should do that. But should it go beyond that to do, should to be a civic leader in climate change, to promote a difference in the views and attitudes of the communities that they serve, to help the local community do adaptation things? Is there a civic role that goes beyond what um, you know, where do we draw those lines for what makes for professional obligations? Yeah, no, I think I think you are are, are, are pointing to very important quest, uh, things, and we have questions coming in now. But I just want to make a, a quick comment on, you know, the Mayo brothers and early physicians at Mayo were instrumental in public health um, initiatives, including clean water and and other infrastructure for the community. And I think. Historically, doctors have played that role. Uh, Dr. Snow in, in London with the cholera epidemic and so, and, and the smoking research. So I, I really believe that most doctors embrace that responsibility um, of, of doing going beyond the, the bedside. But we, we have some interesting questions coming in here. We have one, how might medical training contribute to the shift from rescue to prevention? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I really, I'm happy to 
to, to give my own answer, but I would love to turn this into a conversation as well as a one-on-one. -on -one. I, I mean, I think for one thing, the kinds of content that we are trying to produce for this January Health Equity Summit that I mentioned is important in the training of early career professionals. So understanding the historical antecedents of residential ghettos basically is, is an important thing for anybody to understand. And then how it connects to inequitable health outcomes what the connection is between um, the chronic illnesses that providers are seeing in their offices and the conditions under which people live. At least knowledge of that is an important part of an educated uh, nurse or physician's early training experiences. And, and then comes the question of how much time, how much, uh, I also am very aware that healthcare providers are under enormous time constraints, both during their training periods and afterwards. So what is reasonable to expect people to be able to do? Isn't it enough to become a, a highly skilled professional offering individual care? Do we also expect to have a civic role? I mean, that is, I don't have the answer. I'm just, I really am only asking the question. And I think um, it's something that we need to invent an answer to together. Thank you. We yeah, also I'd love to, would Keith like to respond to that himself? Does he have a thought about it? Uh, or, or maybe they can't speak from where they are. I think we've turned off the technology to do that. Yeah, there isn't a mechanism for responding, yeah. unfortunately. But, okay. uh, but we have a couple of other questions here. Is, okay. But there is one answer that the, your duties as a public health practitioner are but a subset of greater duties and civic obligations as a person and embedded community member. This is by yeah. um, And then we have another question from our chaplains. What suggestions do you have for clinical chaplains to offer for community support to healthcare workers? Right. I, I think that it's really important that we are providing support. Um, I can't say what clinical chaplains should do, not being a chaplain myself, but I am certain that there is a very important role to play. I feel like our, so many health systems are in crisis or near crisis. And there's almost a, there's a, it's, it's also an existential crisis of meaning. And I think cl clinical chaplains have a great role in helping people regain their sense of purpose and their sense of support. Um, and some of that support should be to the workers themselves, but is there perhaps also a role helping the executives, the C-suite recognize that they have some responsibilities to build um, systems of support for their, for their professionals? So I think, I think the clinical work can happen both horizontally with, um, with healthcare workers directly and also looking upward to the responsibilities that the C-suite and the board have for recognizing the enormous pressures on healthcare workers now. Thank you. And then I have one here from Kanda Skiba that says, I, she doesn't think that this is only the respons responsibility of healthcare providers, but also as a professor of higher education that um, she feels that prioritizing humanistic endeavor will inevitably facilitate all humans' abilities to work toward the greater good. And I'm sure this will resonate deeply with you, Millie, with your with your background in in educating mm -hmm. all levels in, in in ethical discourse. Absolutely, I didn't mean. I hope I didn't say anything that um, was confusing. I certainly don't think that I was describing only the responsibilities of healthcare providers. I completely agree with you, Candice. Um, this is about all being together with a sense of common purpose and building a nation together in which we can solve collective problems. And everybody has to play a role in that. And there's so many levers. There's, there's higher education, there's public schooling, there's healthcare, there's industry, um, there's the arts, which can help hold up a mirror to help us see new ways of trusting in one another. So I completely agree with your comment. Yes, and then, then we have several questions here. How do we remove 
the politics from the scientific response. And I think that is a very important um, question and one that I've often debated with my patients is how did a disease and, and medicine become so polarized? I was naive enough to think that we could come together around a common threat and the opposite has been true. Well, I think this is a huge, huge complicated uh, problem, what, what people call a wicked problem because it has, it requires fundamental change in so many different dimensions simultaneously. We have allowed a huge wealth gap in this country where the, there's a much smaller middle class than ever before. People feel they're struggling to stay in the middle class and more, more numbers of poor people and more numbers of extremely wealthy people. And we've turned an eye to that problem. We also didn't recognize the degree to which globalization would undermine people in the American, in, in the United States in rural areas or in areas that had been dependent on manufacturing. And, and then all the issues of systemic racism that I've, I've brought up. So, so there are people don't, if people don't feel that they're being attended to or that they have a fair shake, they're more vulnerable to demagoguery. And then if we've got a social media world where crazy, crazy things are being disseminated at a rapid rate to highly vulnerable people who already feel some resentment or feel that they haven't been heard, um, that's a very difficult and volatile mix. And then if we have leaders who take advantage of that, you know, we're extremely vulnerable. So um, I think we have to fix social media. It has to be regulated. It is now a publishing platform. You know, Facebook wants to say that it's all about free speech, but you know, it should have journal. In my opinion, there should we should be applying journalism ethics to so, to social media, and they don't want to see themselves as journalists, but they are publishers, and they seem to feel that they don't have responsibility for checking sources or making sure that what they're saying is true. Whereas traditional journalism has an ethical obligation to check sources. You usually have to have more than one source for a reputable paper to publish something quite um, extraordinary. And um, there used to be journalism ethics. Well, social media has always said it's not journalism and it's not subject to those criteria, but I believe that we have to make them subject to that criteria. And I said in my formal remarks, either they have to be regulated <clears throat> or we need a different business model that isn't constantly rewarding um, eyeballs just for the sake of eyeballs. Um, and maybe if we could change the, 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 fi the financial incentives that might also work, but I think we're not, I don't think we should avoid regulatory change. And then that brings me to another issue, which is uh, something we talk about in our report, which is somehow our cultural narrative has talks about regulation as though it's always a bad thing. And again, it wants to like create more freedom for all the players, for industry to innovate and all of that um, to so far, to, but to such an extent that now we think regulation is somehow in and of itself a bad thing. And of course we need regulation to have a healthy, to have healthy, um, a healthy economy and to have integrity. Um, we don't wanna over-regulate, that's also wrong, but we seem to have thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah, those are important um, issues uh, that underpin the uh, erosion of trust that, that you emphasized uh, when, when people believe different realities. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to end here with, with uh, two comments that are connected. Uh, one is by Subin Master, where he talks about healthcare institutions having a moral and social responsibility to go beyond individual care into preventive medicine and social mm -hmm. welfare. But, but then the question, from from Karen Mahar is, you know, where where should we draw the line between the responsibilities of the state to uh, care for its citizens and 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 you know, our health care? Are we asking healthcare institutions to step in where the state has failed, essentially? Uh, yes, <laughs> the, <laughs> this is easy to answer in the minute that we have left. Yes, the state has failed. I think this is as much a political. It's, a, it's politicized and it's politicized because there's been failed political um, leadership. I think, and I, I, 
when the pandemic first started, especially when the pandemic first started. I think that um, the Biden administration has done a good job of getting vaccination out there, and I support their their um, calls for certain kinds of mandates. But um, we're putting too much on health. I think healthcare systems need to do a lot now because the state hasn't done it, and because we've lost the county, even at the county level, our public health infrastructure. You guys are on the hot seat. Health Clinic is committed to creating a safe environment for our patients and staff. To ensure everyone's safety, we re I thought maybe you were gonna show something that Mayo was doing. Is that what that was? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry that we get overhead pages and there's nothing we can do when they come. Unfortunately, um, they interrupted us here, but... Um, and, uh, but we're getting some thanks here, but we're also getting some concerns about how guidance has changed over time, undermining trust, um, you know, as the science has evolved. So this is, you know, we can for another hour here with, with the questions that we're getting in now. So I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but thank you so much. And um, Dr. Solomon is sticking around a little bit longer if there are people who, who, um, who want, um, to want to ask more questions and um and so we'll stay on a little bit longer thank you everyone for participation and thank you dr solomon for your wonderful talk and presentation you want to look at the question and answer um, yeah mm -hmm. is the 21 there the number of questions or the number of people it's the number of questions okay. um, and so we've covered most of the top ones um and then um there's one from amelia barwise um who talks about maybe using stories of uh, people not able to ask access intensive care as useful to help public the public understand the consequences um I'm sorry, I couldn't see that question. Could you say that again? Oh, so she says, do you think that stories about those not able to access ICU due to COVID um, are useful to help the public understand the consequences of getting COVID and how it impacts others? I'm a little worried about that because I think we're, we're in such a lack of trust moment that um, people will just rail against rationing. It'll, it'll, you know, they'll just rail against it. And we could, you know, in fact, in the early period when these crisis standards of care were being de first developed in the sp late winter, spring, early spring of 2020, um, people weren't taking to heart. They were blaming healthcare for rationing rather than taking to heart the reality of what, um, uh, of what healthcare was trying was facing and that they were trying to do the best thing for the most people. Um, so I don't know if that's the best strategy. I wonder if more focus on those who have died in the community and trying to pay tribute to them, having religious organizations, so you know, churches and mosques and synagogues, making some kind of statements of honoring the dead, I mean, that would help people sink the severity of this sink in rather than the fact that they're not getting something from healthcare. I don't know, I think this is a really worthy question and, and worth some smart group of people spending some time thinking about. How do we, how do we get that message out? Yeah, I mean, but even people who, yeah, I saw on the news the other day, just that even families that have been devastated who had decided not to vaccinate and lost three family members, they still said they were okay that they hadn't gotten vaccinated. So people are digging in in a way that's very hard to know how to, it's very no, hard to know how to meet them. But what is interesting is that all the data show that these mandates are working, even if you can't change the heart and mind, People are going along with it if they are going to lose something like their job or if they're going to have um, burdensome testing requirements. So maybe it isn't a hearts and minds story. Maybe it's a, okay, we're going to, this is now required. Yeah. 
I thank you for that question. I think it's pretty hard. I don't know the answers. It's hard to know how to change uh, change the, especially like you said, after things have gotten so polarized and people have really dug in. But um, BJ Larson has a question here, appreciating your input on community health worker expansion to the grassroots, including barber shops, shops etc. And he asks, it's a kind of in the same way. Do you have ideas how we can reduce the polarization created by a liberty stance so that we can partner together in local communities for good effect? You know, so I'm hopeful that there are people in the middle who would hear the kind of argument I just gave you. People in the middle who might say, oh, right, liberty isn't, doesn't mean I'm free to harm somebody else. You know, we all agree to stop at stop signs. Um, and so for those who are movable, I think, my, you know, discussions about what's the meaning of liberty. Why do we want freedom? We want it so that we can pursue our own life goals. And if we're all sick, that's hardly enhancing our liberty. If we all have to lock down again, that's hardly enhancing it. So I think there's a reason, there's a role for people in the middle to, to sort of hear my argument. And maybe some of those people would be movable. But then there's a group of people who I don't think are, it is possible to affect now. There's a kind of I don't know what to call it, but I, I think that group is maybe just not movable. And all we have to do is try to reach the people in the middle that are, and through strong public policy, like these requirements for vaccination by employers, um, hope that we get more and more people coming on board. We dug ourselves a hole, but I wanted to end positively. <laughs> no, no, we'll get we'll get to that. So here's one: um, vaccine hesitancy is often grounded in epistemic difference, often encoded into various beliefs about liberty. As one who believes in vaccines, what are some ways I can show respect while also endorsing the notion of mandates, which appear to privilege one epistemic orientation? Say the question part again. How, what, how, As one who believes in vaccines, what are some ways I can show respect while also endorsing the notion of mandates? Which, yeah. Right. So, right. I, I think the most strategic, but also respectful strategy is to identify people from within the community that you want to influence to help carry that flag. The messenger being more important than the message. Most communities do have leaders inside them who want change or want an improvement in some, air, some way that the rest of their community hasn't come to yet. I mean, think about how we've wanted to change, um, oh, I'm forgetting what it's called, but, um, in Africa and in some communities in Africa, especially, but also in other parts of the world um, where there were dangerous um, surgeries for, against um, reproductive, I'm just forgetting. I, I, what happened is my neighbor is mowing <laughs> and now is under my window and there's this huge booming sound. I'm very glad that none of you can hear it. Anyway, um, when we're outside a culture, and in a way that's what this is, even though it's inside America, when you're outside a culture, the important thing is to try to develop some allies and from within that culture who can help be spokespeople for it. So I would try to identify people who seem to have the ability to open their minds to the information that you wanna provide. I don't think all um, epistemic differences are equal. I, I, I don't think we should be epistemological relativists. I think it, there, there are some things that are just not right, um, but it doesn't work for us to be outside saying it's not right. It's much better to identify partners. So for example, I was really excited about the evangelical program that I saw. And um, there was an evangelical minister who wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. He developed a special curriculum, a special sort of kit of answers. And he chose answers about topics that were super important to the evangelical community. There were very specific religious concerns they had, and he took their concerns and showed respect to them by knowing them, first of all, knowing them, identifying them, and respectfully answering them. 
but that would have been very different than me doing answering those questions. So I think it's a partnership with with people that are uh, exceptional inside their own communities. And and that that mirrors what um, Dr. Jacobson here, ha who has been advocating for for vaccines um, for a very long time, recommends we do is to first listen to the concerns, and then respectfully you know, acknowledge those concerns, whether we agree with them or not, before yeah. you know, pivoting to a, a strong recommendation. And I have found that uh, helpful when talking to patients, because I also was afraid in the beginning of these medications or these vaccines that were developed so fast and were of a completely new, right, etc. So I can, I can empathize with patients there and say, yes, I was also concerned, but I'm no longer concerned. You know, I have gathered enough evidence to move forward and accept and embrace this as the miracle that it is and so i think it's always you know even if we don't agree with a person we can always acknowledge their concern before agreeing to disagree or or, or recommending um, we don't want to shame anybody that's right and usually there's a good reason i, I mean somewhere hidden deep there's there is often a there is often a reason i i've heard people when i've had these kind of conversations with some people who who really don't want to be vaccinated they've told me stories of of encounters with the healthcare system that were justified cynicism you know that justified their their distrust so i think we have to give the benefit of the doubt that there's something gone going on with some of these concerns that are really legitimate and I have a couple of questions here about the recording um, that I, I would like to answer so that there will be a recording accessible um, and, and we can um, make that available to people. And um, you were also gonna share it on the Hastings Center website, uh, Millie, right? Um, yeah. yeah. For people who potentially are joining us from outside of Mayo. And uh, there's one from St. Paul uh, asking us to share the reference for the uh, New York Times op-ed op from the evangelical perspective. Is, do you have a possibility of somehow sharing that? Uh, yeah, we will find it. And um, how, should I just get it to you, Bjork? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering how we would get, a, con get in contact with this person if they're outside of Mayo. I should have oh, put out some email. I see um, an email. So have them email viziz at the Hastings Center dot org. V i z z i s at the Hastings Center dot org, and say that um, I, I've offered to send them the New York Times op ed. Wonderful. From Thank you. Yes, there is. I'm thinking. We probably touched on most of the questions here. Um, Danny just said she sent the link. Perfect. To Thank the chat, you. to the chat, so you can get, grab it right now. All right, let's see. So can I put that in the question and answer somehow? Um, hmm. I, uh, I input it into the Q&A and I'll put oh. it into the chat as well. Perfect, thank you. Great. And then we maybe should put the registration for the Health Equity Summit in there too. Oh, that would be marvelous. Yes, I could figure out how to input something in the Q&A. Um, maybe Danny's better, <laughs> better, better um, equipped to do that. Um, let's see. I don't know how to, how to put that in there. Um, Can Annie do it? Let's see. I just uh, placed it in the chat. You Everybody can the chat. Can, the, can, the, can the group see the chat now? Because I think they had it disabled in the beginning. I, I'll put it in. Yes, they room. can. They can? They can? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. Dr. Thorstein daughter, can we save the chat, the, the Q&A here so I can see these questions later and think some more about them? Because some of them are really good. Yes, let me see if I can somehow grab yep, that. Yep, I will save the chat. 
Thank you. you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Great. Great. I think we're probably we're 15 minutes over. I think, I think we can probably close now. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. And thank you, everybody, for participation. Thank you for the invitation.